So, 2022, am I right? 2020. Can I be honest with you guys? This is like my fifth attempt at trying to write this opening paragraph in some way that doesn't just boil down to, well, this year some good things happened and some bad things happened, but overall, Morbius. So let's just go ahead and drop any expectation of this video going anywhere. Yep, it's that time of the year where I get to pretend my opinion matters twice as much, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome you all to my big fuck off, fashionably late as always, completely comprehensive, 100% objective, possibly maybe, but most definitely gay list of things that are good. Probably. I don't know, I've never done this kind of thing before, so as I walk myself through getting my cherry pop, just keep in mind that I'm not really one to favor flash over substance, so I guess it's a good thing that Nope features both in spades. Haven't you heard the news? Movies finally feel like movies again, and with this exciting new development brings the return of that oh-so-special brand of discourse that makes me want to pop a cyanide tablet. When Jordan Peele's latest film came out, there was a decent amount of discussion on whether or not the film actually had a point. I know, right? Kind of a stupid thing to care about. I mean, the film doesn't need to have a point, but in retrospect, maybe everyone who was arguing this was onto something. Maybe there's absolutely nothing to read into about a story where a giant UFO flies over Hollywood and literally swallows up anyone who looks at it and spits them out. Oh, and the alien even kind of looks like a camera too. Yep, absolutely nothing to read into here. But the fact that so much of what this film is trying to say went over the heads of so many viewers kind of speaks to how masterful Peel has become at subtly injecting commentary into his movies. I think it's probably the single thing that will make Nope, and I guess the rest of his filmography stand the test of time. There is so much meaning you can derive out of this movie, and the way it's constructed begs you to think about how it all fits together. However, this ties into what's maybe my only real criticism of Nope, and that's that the film is so much more interesting to talk about than it is to actually watch, mostly because at a certain point, the screenplay trades in a lot of said substance for Flash. I don't know if I can say that it makes for the most cohesive or even necessarily satisfying experience, but what I do know is that the fact that the movie stops and forces you to gawk at its horrific, jaw-dropping magnificence is most definitely part of that oh-so-elusive point that Peel was trying to make, and I will always respect the film for that. And hey, would you look at that, I made it through talking about Nope without just saying the word spectacle repeatedly while merely gesturing in the vague direction of an opinion. You know, what most people do. Yup, I really went against the grain with this one. Kind of like how Beyonce did on her most recent album. Not to compare myself to Beyonce, but you know, I guess we've gotten this far. TikTok has done some strange things to the music industry, and like I get that that's a statement that holds much less weight than it once did, because at this point, TikTok is the music industry, and it is very susceptible to abrupt change. It can be exciting, but it can also make for a very, very dull year, complete with the most undanceable dance tracks you've ever heard, featuring the laziest sampling you can imagine. That's right, the 90s are back in the stupidest fucking way possible. Suffice it to say, it was exhausting, but there is a silver lining here. Artists like SZA, like Twigs, like Beyonce were generous enough not only to do their job, but to bless us with some of the best albums of the year, all of which pull inspiration from that 90s brand of bouncy house music, but throughout the year, I tended to gravitate more towards Renaissance because of its laser-focused sense of direction. Which, I guess is funny, because as I alluded to earlier, this is kind of the anti-Beyonce record. Again, this is the same woman who practically releases a feature film with each album Cycle. She's always been a spectacle artist, so for her to drop an album as low-key as this, well, first of all, it made it really difficult to get footage for this video, so, you know, thanks. But for Beyonce to drop an album as low-key as this, and for it to still become one of the biggest of the year, it just goes to show how absolutely stacked the album is. You're hard-pressed to find a record that came out in the past year that's as fun, as smooth, or as sexy as Renaissance, and the fact that Beyonce can just crawl out of the woodwork, feed the gaze, and then leave, I don't know, it's a bold move, but not quite as bold as bookending your record with a nearly five-hour long ambient track. However, that didn't stop Singaporean singer-songwriter Yule from doing exactly that on their second studio release titled Glitch Princess. If the five hour long song didn't tip you off, it's a dense record, and a really fucking weird one too. It almost borders on that level of pretension where it's just weird for the sake of being weird. Almost. But everything that Glitch Princess has to offer feels so intentional, so deliberate, and it's what's made me revisit the album countless times throughout the year in an attempt to kind of parse it out. I interpret the record as a statement on the digital lives that virtually all of us lead, how it differs from our reality, and maybe most importantly, how it doesn't. Throughout these tracks, you'll use as pulsing synths, hypnotic beats, and cascading bleeps and bloops to paint a picture of a world ravaged by technology, very similar to our own, but instead of viewing our artificial existences as some form of escapism that you can either embrace or attempt to elude, they instead portray them as an extension of ourselves, and it's just another form of the torturous monotony that rules most of our lives. It's a direction that I rarely see the conversation surrounding technology take, probably for good reason, because it is incredibly depressing the more you think about it. But despite how dour the subject matter is, Glitch Princess still manages to maintain an odd air of hopefulness throughout its runtime, mostly by virtue of Yule clinging to what they know to be quote-unquote real, like what it means to be loved and what it means to be seen. 
And I'm not saying that this is all the record is or that I understand the record completely. I mean, comprehension basically went out the window as soon as I saw that runtime. But what I do know is that it takes an impressively good writer to create an experience surrounding the technological heat death of the world and not have their thesis be summed up as, wow, I'm starting to think that smartphones are actually making us less connected. Almost as impressive is comedian slash part-time sadist slash full-time masochist Nathan Fielder's ability to completely and utterly commit to the bit. Most certainly to his own detriment, but let's back up for a second. For those initiated, you probably know Fielder from one of two things. This... <laughs> or, much more likely, his Comedy Central series, Nathan For You, the premise of which is fairly simple. He helps take the struggling out of struggling businesses, and it's all spun in a way to make the business owners regret ever asking for his help. It is ridiculously entertaining to watch. But as is tradition, the cyclical cycle of the internet just had to rear its ugly head, and as such, I've seen more than a few why Nathan For You is bad actually arguments crop up, contending that the show is manipulative towards the very real people featured in the show. Whether or not this is actually true is debatable, I don't understand. What? Why does it help you if you drink your grandson's pee? That's what they say. Yeah. Who says that? My grandma. Your Long grandma time said. Ago. Yeah. You I drink saw your grandson's yeah, pee if you get scared. Not grandsons, any little kid. But the rehearsal, Fielder's flashy new HBO series, addresses this very thing. The premise of this show is fairly simple. Fielder helps everyday people through difficult life events by allowing them to rehearse said event as many times as they'd like. Right for comedy, right? Oh my sweet, sweet, naive child. You have no idea where you're getting into. As you get deeper and deeper into the show, the premise that you were originally promised gives way to a much more sad conclusion. Yes, it is inherently manipulative to frame real people in a way that makes them a pariah, even if it is kind of funny. So Fielder's response to this is to become the butt of the joke, and while it can be hilarious, the implications that this brings not only on Nathan himself, but on everyone that he interacts with through these rehearsals is deeply troubling in a way that I find really hard to put into words. So I'll leave it at this. Anyone who would want to relive any given moment over and over again in some kind of attempt to be become the master of their own destiny is kind of missing the point of the whole human experience thing. And if you still don't get that this is what the rehearsal is trying to say, the finale practically screams this at you because, let's be honest, sometimes subtlety is stupid, a sentiment that Eric Kripke, showrunner of The Boys, would probably agree with, which made the discourse surrounding the show as its third season was rolling out so much funnier. Again, for those in the back, this is the show where the main villain, a man who daydreams about murdering people on a mass scale for simply daring to criticize him, literally has the American flag strapped to his back. He spent pretty much the entirety of last season getting off on oppressing others with his new girlfriend, who is revealed to be a Nazi. The Boys might just be the least subtle show to ever fucking exist. It wears its anti-establishment politics on its sleeve, so I can't help but be endlessly amused by the fact that three seasons in, the right finally figured out that the show was secretly about them the entire time. It just, it warms my heart. Oh, and the show is also just really good. In a genre defined not only by the worst fanbase, but also by a steadfast resistance towards any type of change, partially because of said worst fanbase, The Boys makes the bold decision to actually have a pulse and an identity. Partially because of its politics, yes, but mostly because of its excellent character writing. This season is framed around the titular boys now having access to the godlike abilities that they've thus far condemned, and although this may seem a bit gimmicky at first, it leads to some of the best moments for character development in the whole series thanks in no small part to this new addition, bringing out the worst traits in our protagonists. In contrast to previous seasons, this time around, there's less of an emphasis on big story beats and more placed on the understated growth of both our heroes and villains, making for what's, ironically, the most subtle season of the boys yet. Which I guess is all to say that the show still hasn't lost its edge, both in the sense that it's still just as innovative as it ever has been, and in a much more literal sense, it's also just as unapologetically profane as you'd come to expect, but not in any way that detracts from everything else going on. It's honestly something that I find really commendable because of writing these scripts has taught me anything, it's that that is a very fine line to try to tread. But this just goes to show how much control the writers of the boys actually have over their baby, as well as highlighting just how deeply flawed the average made-for-adults consumed by 11-year-olds show really is. The current landscape of adult animation is pitiful, for a multitude of reasons, but for simplicity's sake, let's say it's because they're all way too similar. Every joke in almost every one of these shows is either be unnecessarily vulgar or break the fourth wall. It makes for an exhausting viewing experience, so I can't even imagine what it's like to write for one of these
these shows knowing that one day you'll inevitably run out of snappy pop culture references that people can exhale slightly at. However, where most adult animation would go right, Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared comes at you straight through your goddamn screen. If you're around my age, you probably have some vague memory of your weird cousin, or at least some cousin-adjacent freak, showing you one of these videos. However, what you may not know is that the creators of the original YouTube series pulled together enough funding and made an honest-to-god TV show. Six episodes, about 20 minutes a pop, and it's all very, very well constructed. Like seriously, this thing has no right being as good as it is. Each episode acts as a parody of a Sesame Street-esque children's show, much like the YouTube series, but where it differs is that instead of focusing on the grotesque imagery that made the series oh so infamous, since obviously the whole show can't just be blood and guts, this time around a much bigger emphasis is placed on comedy and it really works. Adult animation as a genre is probably at its lowest point at the moment, mostly because of its adamant refusal to find a third joke, but thankfully Don't Hug Me circumvents this pitfall by just being genuinely very witty. Hey, it's you! Yeah, listen, I just want to check something. I get it. You want to learn all about your identity. Who you are! No, I was more hoping that I was dead. What? Don't be silly. You don't die for ages. Aww. You die in the lake. Huh? Seriously, it took a lot of self-control to not put an episode's worth of clips in to more accurately illustrate my point, but just know that I absolutely could have. But even ignoring the humor of this series, the creativity emanating from virtually every aspect of its production honestly blows my mind, and the fact that none of it ever gets stale is all the more remarkable because, in theory, it definitely should. The concept for the first video is like creepypasta map hat bait tier, but the fact that the series has evolved into this incredibly unique surrealist horror comedy shows not only that the creators have complete faith in the idea, but also that they recognize exactly how it needed to be executed. And for fans of the original run who are still on the fence about this new direction, the fucked visuals you've come to expect are still there, but like the series itself, it's just evolved. Because while gore and viscera can be scary, Don't Hug Me I'm Scared understands that that cosmic existential shit that's where the true horror resides, which is probably more than I can say about the film X, released in early 2022. It's a pretty good slasher that brings up some interesting themes surrounding the stigmatization of sex and sex work in our culture. It is also not on this list, simply because, in my opinion, it does being a slasher a lot better than it does cohesively linking theme and plot. However, Pearl, on the other hand... That's a good-ass movie. It abandons a lot of the broad-stroke storytelling of its predecessor in favor of a more story-driven film, and because of this, Pearl isn't held back by the fact that it is a prequel to X. Not to say that the film completely abandons the points X tried to make, because it doesn't, but it's just not as big of a focus here. Honestly, it's barely even a horror movie, at least not in the way X was. The film follows a titular character as she digs her way to the bottom of the mental illness casserole that I like to call Living in Texas, and it's all incredibly compelling, especially considering that we pretty much know what all of this set up is building towards. So yeah, in a year that was honestly pretty good for horror, and despite the fact that the film is kind of just country girls make do the motion picture, Pearl stands out of my mind not because it has some high concept plot or some gimmick to sell you on, but because it embraces its relative simplicity in order to show you what it's capable of. In terms of its music, the psychology of its characters, its willingness to completely bind itself to its time period, its overall atmosphere, and, maybe most importantly, Paul Dano's performance as the Riddler. Wait, I think I got my notes mixed up. Hold on. I kind of see the Batman as a direct response to how pop culture has treated the character in recent years. For those watching who regularly have sex, you may be a bit confused by that statement. Like, has Batman really been treated that badly? All the movies he's in are generally pretty good, you know, if you ignore the ones that aren't. But I find that there's a certain ethos to the character that almost every adaptation chooses to ignore. Above all, he should be a hero. However, this aspect of the character is often left to the wayside in favor of more screen time depicting our beloved Dark Knight strangling minorities, I guess in an attempt to make him seem like more of a a badass, but like, he's fucking Batman. He didn't need your help. Matt Reeves, the director of the Cape Crusaders' latest outing, knows this all too well, and it's why the film follows Bruce as he learns he needs to be more than just some big bulging biceps attached to a pair of pointy ears. It's nice, it rounds the film out, adds some additional depth, makes everything we saw have a purpose, and just by virtue of that alone, it already clears like 95% of its contemporaries, but lucky for me, this point also comes with a whole movie, primed and ready to be fangirled over by yours truly. But you probably already know that The Batman features the most fully realized Gotham that has ever been put to film, just like you probably already know that the film's cast is pretty much perfect, just like you probably already know that I wasn't talking about their acting back there. So instead of me gushing about a movie I adore, I'd like to take some time to talk about what I'd like out of a prospective sequel. You know, give me some weird shit, give me Professor Pig in a movie, give me some This Ain't Your Mama's Batman movie type of shit, you know? Challenge me. 
the audience. So I'll finally be able to say that the Batman 2 working title is like the Dark Souls of being compared to Elden Ring. What? Uh, video game? You don't talk about those. Well, you're right, and there's a good reason I don't. It's because they are incredibly difficult to write about because, at least to me, how a game feels to play is the single biggest thing that defines them, and words don't lend themselves well to describing the intangible, so I give up. Anyone who doesn't subscribe to that hardcore gamer grind set, just go ahead and tune out for the next minute or so, I promise this won't be on the exam. But for those still with me, you undoubtedly already know that Elden Ring will undoubtedly go down in history as one of the most influential games of all time. Probably one of the most ambitious, too. The sheer scope of what the game has to offer is incredible, and the fact that From Software was able to create an open world that is so seamlessly able to slide itself into what we've come to expect out of the Souls experience is insane. The gameplay is so tight and focused, the environment is so rich and enthralling, the bosses. And because of all of this, Elden Ring will always be a perfect game in my eyes. It's something that I would love to be able to say, but almost as spectacularly as the game begins, Elden Ring's last third or so crumbles under the weight of all of the mechanics it's been juggling. Not to really get into it here, because again, not my wheelhouse, but after you reach a certain point in the game, Elden Ring's boss design and open world philosophy gives you a choice. Do you want to overpower yourself to the point where virtually every obstacle in your path becomes a joke, or do you want to suffer? Its systems break, and not in any way that makes the game more fun or even more interesting. Amazingly, the game somehow made a chore out of swinging your detached helicopter blade at all the lands between sweaty, oiled up, loincloth clad men. Now that I have all of your attention, <clears throat> welcome back by the way, let's summarize. Elden Ring does certain things better than any other game before it, and I love it for that. Very few things match the awe and wonder that I felt while exploring the vastness of its world for the first time. Elden Ring also makes you fight this fucking dragon like 87 times, so that makes me feel a little better about how conflicted I am towards it. A feeling that's maybe only rivaled by my thoughts towards Mr. Morale and the Big steppers. Look, I've been a Kendrick fan for a hot minute. At this point, he's a legend. He's dropped classic after classic after classic. He's one of the few artists that really got me into music, and as admittedly lame as this may sound, I genuinely believe that listening and understanding his records have made me a better person. But this album is different, partially because its mission statement seems to be to take Kendrick Lamar off of the pedestal that so many have put him on. For as airtight as much of Kendrick's discography is, one piece of criticism levied towards him that I've always kind of felt hold water is that even from an outsider looking in, it's very obvious that Kendrick feels like he needs to be the one to solve the world's problems. He has a bad case of the old savior complex, and honey, it just might be terminal too. But Lamar is nothing if not self-aware. It's why each one of his albums builds off the last, and it's why this one addresses the elephant in the room. We follow Kendrick through what feels like a therapy session that we're merely catching glimpses of as he reminisces on key moments of his life, and for such a messy concept, the record's sonic palette is suitably chaotic, with heavy booming bass, oddball time signatures, and bizarre vocal passages sprinkled all over this thing. And I'll be the first to admit, some of the ideas Kendrick presents on the record are kind of hit or miss, but god, when they hit, I mean, let's just say they more than make up for the parts that don't. Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers is unconventional, it's brilliant, and it is not Kendrick's best album, not by a long shot. However, it is his most human, and out of this emotion is where much of the record's opulence is born, in stark contrast to Jockstrap's latest project titled I Love You Jennifer B, which is much more barren by design. Not to imply that the record lacks the same sense of grandeur, it's just different, a difference that the duo most definitely prides themselves on. If Jockstrap represents presents anything in terms of their place in the current musical landscape, I think that thing would have to be progress, because Taylor and Georgia are easily the most forward-thinking minds in pop. And you know, now that I think about it, calling these two pop artists is a little backhanded and dishonest, because their refusal to be defined is what defines them. Packaged inside Jennifer B, you'll find these clusters of abstract ideas. Pockets of Baroque pop, stripped back moments that are more singer-songwriter inspired than anything else, sweeping orchestration and glitched out electronica, oftentimes all bundled together in a single track. And it kind of feels like none of what's going on here should work at all, and I think the band knows it too. It's why lyrically, a good chunk of the record seems to be critiquing celebrity with a strong you can't box us in vibe radiating off of every sticky hook and melody. However, I'm not really sure how I should appraise the album as a whole, because while part of the whole lack of definition thing is decidedly intentional, part of it decidedly isn't, and reads more like sonic growing pains as evidenced by the fact that the album loses a lot of cohesion the deeper you get into it. And I could sit here and think of another dozen ways to describe Jennifer B, but I think that's to ignore the record's most potent asset, the visceral emotion that's emanating off of every second of this thing. It's not special to me because it has some galaxy brand chord progressions to show off. It's special to me because despite some of the record's displays of maturity, it makes me yearn for simpler times. It's complicated in that way. But as I've grown older and done my due diligence, of consuming as much media as possible, I've found that that quality is what separates good from great, because it takes a special piece of art to make me miss something as tedious and shit as working in food service, but lo and behold, the bear did exactly that. Granted, the mom and pop shop I worked at was not 
not nearly as prestigious as the one featured in the show, nor did it employ anyone who really gave a shit. But even still, the environment fosters a unique sense of camaraderie that you rarely see replicated in media. Probably because most people see TV as a form of escapism from the monotonous plight of the average disheveled white guy. Anyways, the series follows disheveled white guys. He must take over his family's restaurant after a sudden tragedy, and while this is the setup that the plot is framed around, I can hardly say that this is what the show is about. It's about the restaurant, the idea, the establishment, the service, and its inherent hunger, and when the series is allowed to shine a spotlight on this hunger, the bear soars. For evidence, look no further than the season's absolute monster of a penultimate episode in which we, the audience, are taken on a journey in basically every sense of the word. You will feel every emotion you have within its 20 some odd minute runtime while the show redefines what chaos and anxiety even mean, and it's all done in one take. The episode is impressive divorce from context, but the fact that it's all elevated to exceptionally so when you know the motivations of these characters, their relationships to one another, and what's personally at stake for each of them, I think it just goes to show how effective this slice of lifestyle writing can be when the plot takes a backseat in order to paint a picture of a more authentic reality. To me, it's remarkable, but I get that this kind of storytelling isn't for everybody. TV needs to be big, it needs to be exciting, and by virtue of that alone, the bear was never going to be the next Breaking Bad, and you guys already know this sentence's destination, so let's not waste any more time. Better Call Saul did the impossible. It may have taken some time, but I think we finally reached a point where we can say that Better Call Saul has escaped the massive shadow that its predecessor cast over, well, pretty much all of television. But I didn't always think that it could. It's a difficult show to get into precisely because of how much of an effort was made to distance itself from the conventions of Breaking Bad. So as you get deeper and deeper into what's the most slow burniest of slow burns, you may think to yourself, this is kind of boring. Where is all this going? Do I really need to see Jimmy Etta Nettie scheme his way into more money by ruining some poor old woman's social standing? And while I've always liked the show, I'd be lying if I said that these kinds of errant thoughts didn't ping pong across my mind. But season six, the show's final season, is what convinced me, and please do excuse my Reddit, I truly am sorry, that Vince Gilligan can do no wrong, and that even when he does, it's eventually made right. This final season made everything click into place for me every loose end, and I do mean every single loose end has been tied up in the most satisfying way possible. In a show full of great performances, memorable locales, and thrilling events, the fact that it just never stopped getting better is so laudable. It does everything a prequel should do, especially in regards to completely recontextualizing the original work. Like I said before, Better Call Saul did the impossible. It made one of the most tragically sympathetic characters I've ever seen out of the comic relief lawyer who practically introduced himself to the world with a yo mama joke. But with all that being said, I still don't know if I can say for sure that Saul is a better show than Breaking Bad, because it does owe so much of its identity to what came prior. A problem that definitely doesn't plague Severance, a new series whose winding twists and turns are so thoroughly compelling that I feel like it would be a massive disservice to go into any more detail here. So instead, I'll bestow the show with the highest compliment I can give, which is that despite all of the fuckery that Apple makes you go through to sign up for their nigh-worthless streaming service, despite all of that, it was still 100% worth it. Which brings me to number one. Look, I imagine a lot of you may be staring at the runtime of this video, tick tick ticking down, mostly in puzzlement, because it may seem like some of my picks are just me trying to be quirky and different for, I don't know, clout purposes, I guess? So to put these allegations to rest, I'd just like to make it perfectly clear that sometimes the obvious choice is the best choice. Everything Everywhere All at Once is probably the best movie I have ever seen, and for everyone watching this, that's a statement you probably either agree with or you haven't seen the movie. And like, I really do get it. I had my doubts that it could possibly live up to the insane amounts of praise that it had received from virtually everybody, but maybe because I went into the film with some skepticism, the experience I got out of it was all the more rewarding. Simply put, Everything Everywhere All at Once is a film against nihilism, and in a world full of melancholic dejection, I cannot stress enough just how welcome a movie like this really is. Because it's so easy to live your life not caring about anyone or believing in anything, and I guess at the end of the day, all of these cynics are right. Yes, in the grand scheme of things, nothing truly matters, but god, what a shitty way to live your life. It's a worldview that only serves to make you and those around you more miserable, but no, totally, I think it's super cool that you live by philosophies you stole from Rick and Morty. And I could go into the mechanics of how seamlessly this concept is woven into virtually every aspect of the film, but I feel if I were to pick it apart and examine all of its features under a microscope, that's kind of missing the point. To enjoy the little things, to enjoy life. So yeah, I guess at the end of the day, the real everything was the everywhere that we learned all at once. Yes, that is how I'm ending it. <laughs>